I am so excited to be live with you, got the technology figured out, and the topic today looks like it's a really hot topic with everyone. It's why won't my MS doctor treat parasites? If we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And this is a question that a lot of people ask me from all over the world is, why won't my doctor, number one, even consider that I have parasites, just they don't believe we have parasites, don't believe MS is caused by parasites, and they won't treat parasites. And so this can be a real problem because it's really difficult for us to get help, for us to get medical help, because very often these treatments require prescriptions. There are some um, antimicrobial herbs that we can use, uh, of course, this is an educational talk, so I'm not going to be prescribing or diagnosing for every, anyone, but just in a general sense. But when we need the parasite drug treatments, it's really difficult because our practitioners are not on board to help us. So it is a dilemma that we face. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the, the challenges they, that we have, number one, we'll start with our healthcare system, what we're up against, what we're dealing with. Then we're going to go into talking about, like, how do we find a practitioner? You know, because there are people that are finding practitioners. So how do we find one? What kind of questions do we ask? Because we, we want to talk in a respectful manner. We do not want to end up having, you know, a big argument or a fight. And we, we really want... We just want to get help and we want to avoid conflict. <laughs> and so we are looking for the right practitioner. So what are some questions we can ask them or how do we approach this? And then we're going to talk about what kind of practitioners we do need to recover from these parasitic infestations that are causing MS and other chronic diseases. And then I'll be sharing, we don't have to wait because if you don't find a practitioner, there are answers for you. So I can see, yay. <laughs> I can see that you guys are joining. It takes a couple of minutes here. I just wanted to make sure because I've been having challenges. I really hope Facebook will work this time. I spent several hours with uh, the streaming company trying to get it sorted out. I don't know why, but anyhow, so hopefully it'll work. So let's start off with our healthcare system. So a lot of these things are common sense, and actually I'm going to go over to the Facebook comments because when we posted this, there were some really, really good comments. So Kelly said, doctors will be out of work if we treat parasites because there will be no diseases. <laughs> Boy, is she ever wise. And then Teresa said, big pharma makes way too much money off of all the medications to think about uh to think about the ones suffering. So that is true. There is no incentive for to find a cure. And then someone else shared that, oh, this was really interesting. So because they think that we don't have parasites, totally blew my mind when I asked my doctor a couple of years ago, I literally looked at him like he was an idiot. And of course, that's not a respectful manner, but it, it's just shocking. Like, if we live in a country and we know that our, paras our pets can get parasites, we know that if you just go on the CDC for your country, they will list different human diseases caused by parasites that are in your country. But our doctors are, they're not idiots, they're taught. All of us, like if we spend enough time being programmed in one direction, then we really believe what we are taught. And we've probably seen that over the past couple of years too, some of us. Another person shared that exposure to radiation um, really is important in parasitic infestations. And yes, that is one factor, but I would say the overuse of antibiotic was probably a bigger factor. Um, and then another person shared, Adriana shared, because our doctors don't know how to treat parasites. And that is another true question. It's a good question. And there is no money for a cure. Uh, Stephen or Stephen said, uh, so there, we all have a general sense of why our doctors won't treat parasites. But today, let's just go into the, the real detail. So number one, our healthcare system has become very, very compartmentalized, very specialized, very complicated. 
right? They have all these different divisions of medical practice. There are hundreds of them, whether it's a, a, a division or a, it could be a subspecialist or a specialist. So we have different practitioners like uh, P in pediatrics and allergists, our cardiologists, dermatologists, endocrinologists, oncologists, gastro and gastroenterologists, parasitologists, and the list goes on and on and on. And the crazy thing is that when you step away from that, when you get sick, like I did, or my the, the wellness champions I work with, and you step away from that that whole system of all these hundreds of different specialized compartments where, you know, like if you've got a, a rash, a persistent rash, we've got to send you to a skin specialist. If you have neurological symptoms, we have to send you to a neurologist. And it's a very, very expensive system. And what we have found is that actually health is not that complicated. It's not that compartmentalized. It's not that specialized. There are a few very basic principles that we follow. And unfortunately, this healthcare system we have today has resulted in an industry, like a huge multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And so... There is so much money involved, and I, I know most of you understand this, but our, our medical schools are greatly influenced. What our doctors learn in them, they're, like they're funded. The medical schools are funded by big pharma. So when you go to school for 10 years plus and you're taught, you know, like, okay, look for these symptoms and there's this drug, and you look for these symptoms and there's that drug, and you look for these symptoms and there's this, or there's this disease label and you, this is how we treat it. Right? So it's always these symptoms, this disease label, and this is how we treat it. And so you spend all these years where I actually had a conversation with a neurologist and he said, because I had been MS free for so many years and, and I just, I was in university and I just wanted to get a letter in case I, I had student loans and I just wanted to drop down and I didn't have to repay my loans to, like to a lower course load. And so I just always like to have a safety net. So I went to that neurologist and, you know, he was like, oh, wow, great, you're in remission, you don't have any symptoms. And I said, do you want to know what I've been doing? And he said, no, that's okay. He said, your nerves have nothing to do with your digestive tract or any other part of your body. And that's how they've been taught, right? They've been taught that a neurologist specializes in nerves and he's the expert in MS because it's only the nerves that are impacted and that's not the case at all. Because when our students have MS, they often have more than one disease. They have symptoms of so many different things. They might have allergies. They might have skin rashes. They might have um, bruising. They might have blood issues. They might have inflammatory bowel disease. They might have inflamed joints, um, edema. Like it just goes on and on and on. So although our healthcare system has compartmentalized all of these different diseases, the truth of the matter is that it's all connected. So <clears throat> number one, we've compartmentalized it. Number two, big pharma has influenced the education of our doctors in a really big way, in a way that's advantageous to selling their drugs. Number three, and this has happened over the last, I don't know how many years, but the big pharma, actually, they pay our doctors to prescribe medications. So this is where, yay. Oh, dear. Facebook user lost me. Okay. Was on Facebook. Maybe it isn't going to work for Facebook. I have spent enough hours trying to figure out why Facebook won't connect. Um, anyhow, so if you are on Facebook, you can always join us on YouTube. So... Um, with respect to the MS drugs, and I'm just going to speak about them because this is what I know, is that the MS doctors, the neurologists, are paid kickbacks for prescribing the MS drugs. A lot of money. There, Apparently there is a website that you can go to in the United States that you can go and look up the doctor and see how much they're compensated. And it's a lot of money. So Aside from what I just shared is that like even our global news, which is a local news in Canada, they reported that Big Pharma paid out $151 million to doctors and hospitals just in the year 2017 to 2018, but they weren't able to figure out who got paid or why they got paid. So this is not 
what doctors are charging the government for health care, like in Canada. This is not um, what maybe doctors might be charging their patients. This is on top. So 151 million. And then another source, another um, news source shared that over 250,000 physicians were received over half a million dollars each by drug makers, so for, by drug makers and medical devices companies. And that was just in the five years before 2019. So they earned, that's an additional on top of their wage for doing a practice. What they're charging, so like in the United States, if they're charging patients or if they're billing companies, this is on top. And then also within that group of 2,500 physicians that received at least a half a million dollars per year for prescribing drugs and medical devices. Out of that group, there were at least 700 that made over a million dollars a year. So unfortunately, you know, this has become an industry. This has become a very, very lucrative industry. So first of all, our doctors are trained in a certain way of thinking. And then once they are out working, then they are paid to prescribe these drugs. And they, they've spent so many years learning that they are the experts. The only solutions are these disease modifying drugs, maintenance drugs. And so they, they have bought into it and then they get financially hooked into it because you know, practices are they're expensive, they're busy, they have a lot of overhead, they have nurses, they have staff, and they have all this insurance and things like that. And so you bet having an extra half a million dollars a year or a million dollars a year or more is very, it's a great incentive. And in their training, they have learned that, they've been taught this, and it's completely inaccurate, that parasites are only present in underdeveloped countries. And people can only get parasites if they travel to those countries and they pick it up. Otherwise, you don't get parasites. And if you think you have a parasite, you get a parasite test done. And our parasite tests are very, very poor. Most of the parasites do not show up on these tests. So number one, they normally don't test for parasites. And then if they do test for parasites, it's very rare that the parasites will show up. So we have this situation where our doctors, they are, they're not trained to recognize parasite symptoms, to identify them. They don't have good tests. They don't believe we even have them. So they're not going to help us in that area unless they are a forward thinking practitioner. So this is usually not the neurologist. So I'm gonna share with you some different ideas if you're looking for someone to help you. And this is what I help my students do too. So number one, you're looking for a practitioner, a doctor. Um, the kinds of doctors that you would need are two kinds. Number one, energy testing, and that's usually not an MD. So that would not be a general practitioner. It, it could be a functional medicine doctor. Uh, sorry, it could be a functional medicine doctor if they've learned energy testing. It could be a naturopath. It could be a nurse practitioner. But on their website, they should say that they do some type of energy testing. Sometimes they use machines like an AMA machine, an EAV machine, a vagus machine. Sometimes they do muscle testing like a chiropractor could do. Uh, it's called applied kinesiology testing. And so, and then there's also ART testing, which is an advanced muscle testing. So number one, you're looking for some kind of a practitioner that has a skill of energy testing. The second practitioner that you're looking for is somebody who can write a prescription. And that's the dilemma that we face. So we need the energy testing because the stool tests don't give us much information at all, but we still need somebody to write a prescription. And this is the biggest part of the dilemma. So what I recommend is like in most countries, the naturopathic physicians cannot write prescriptions. In Canada, in British Columbia, Canada, the naturopaths can write prescriptions for many of the parasite drugs. They don't really like to because they're kind of stepping out of their 
normal mandate and it's the, you know they're under a lot of scrutiny so they would prefer not to but there are some courageous naturopaths in British Columbia that are willing to really help their patients if they need it and they usually do energy testing so they can do both together but for most states countries provinces that's not the case so you're looking for it could be a, a an integrated practitioner, so it would be more somebody like a functional medicine doctor. It could be a nurse practitioner. Very often they're more holistic. Uh, and sometimes a general practitioner, your family doctor. I wouldn't go to the naturopaths, sorry, the, the neurologists. I wouldn't go to them because they seem to be a little bit more resistant to this whole idea. So those are some ideas. Again, a functional medicine doctor, a nurse practitioner, a general practitioner. So very often there could be a functional medicine doctor or a nurse practitioner or a GP that either they got sick or someone in their family got sick. And that's what really encouraged them to think outside the box, to look outside of this, the training that they've had and to start to explore other avenues because they're not happy with the prognosis for themselves or their loved ones. And, or it could be somebody who's just, you know, really old school and really open and really wants to help you. They don't know a lot about it, but I'll give you some questions that you can ask. And questions are always the best way to go. Never tell them something because they're the expert. They feel they're the expert and we're not. So if you tell them, hey, you know, you know, did you know this and did you know that? And they'll be like, I'm the doctor here. Remember that for a lot of practitioners. So number one, you can even ask your friends or your neighbors or family members or coworkers like, hey, do you know of a good a medical doctor that is kind of integrative, kind of open to doing different integrative practices? And they might point you in the right direction. You can also check websites, right? You can also just do Google searches and just type in, you know, medical doctor, my city, and integrative, uh, just holistic, integrative, those kind of questions. And so then you might find doctors, it depends on the country too, because like in Canada, there is no such thing. The doctors cannot treat parasites. If they do, they will probably lose their license. Uh, in Canada, if you think you have parasites, they'll do a stool test and it'll come back negative. And then if you still really, really believe, and maybe your doctor's kind of like, well, I don't know, but we'll see, then they can refer you to a parasitologist and that's a dead end also, we've seen. Uh, so it, it would have to be like really clear where you went to another country and you got violently sick immediately upon coming home then you might get somewhere with a parasitologist. Otherwise, if it's a chronic disease you're dealing with and you believe it's a parasitic infestation from all the work that you've seen from what I've collected, the research, they're not gonna buy into that, unfortunately. So it makes it a little bit harder, especially in countries like Canada, probably Australia, New Zealand, but in the UK and in the United States, they seem to be a little bit more open. They might have a little bit more privileges or room to be able to practice outside of traditional standard of care. So it's always good to ask questions. So the first question, if you find a doctor, if you find a, somebody who can write prescriptions and you, you just wanna kind of feel out the situation, you wanna get a sense of where they're at. So you don't wanna just kind of throw a bunch of stuff at them, uh, vomit on them about parasites because they're just gonna get their back up and get mad and and just make you feel awful. There are so many people that I've heard that have walked out of doctor's offices, not because they talked about parasites, but even just, you know, like wanting to do a different approach, wanting to do diet and things like that. And some of these doctors, I'm not gonna judge them. They might really, really truly believe that is the only and best option for you and they're worried about you and they don't want you to suffer, but it can be really, really nasty. So the, the to understand that, that you're not gonna convince them is the first thing. So you're just literally going in and you're asking them questions. So um, have you ever heard that MS could be caused by infections? Have you ever heard that theory, that idea? This is something you can ask a doctor or different parasites. And chances are they'll say, uh, well, you know, there could possibly be infections, but they haven't, that would be the nicest 
response. There could possibly be infections, but, they, but we don't know. Like, there's no evidence. There's no scientific evidence to back this up. And then the next question you can say is, like, are you aware that there's this huge body of research looking at the microbiome in multiple sclerosis and how it is different in MS patients versus healthy patients? Like, are you studying this? Are you following this? And But you have to say it in a nice way that it's not condescending and it's not going to make them feel like they're not doing their job. Uh, but again, if you get a negative response right off the bat, then, or if you think, you can even ask, you can even start even more general, like, what do you think about diet for multiple sclerosis? And if they go, oh, diet has nothing to do with MS, there's, it's not going to affect you at all, it's not going to impact you, it's not going to make any difference, you can eat a healthy diet, that's fine, but it's not going to make any difference for MS. If they kind of sound mad and angry, maybe that's a cue already to just stop the conversation. Um, so just remember that if you continue to push or to ask more questions, then you could end up with um, not a very pleasant conversation. So I asked a few questions one time to an allergist, just asking about, you know, candida, because he's, this is like a, allergies and asthma, like, do we have good, do we have tests in Canada for that? And is it possible? And he got really, really mad and he said our appointment was over. So, you know, that's how it goes, but it didn't hurt my feelings, but it, it's just really sad because we're, they're supposed to be open to this, right? The next question I would ask again is, um, do you feel that MS could be caused by infections? So that's something you can ask. You can just write these questions down and just only ask what you feel comfortable asking. So do you feel that MS could be an infectious disease? It could be caused by infections. Um, is it true that parasites cause disease? Is it true that parasites cause disease? Is it possible that parasites that I could get parasites in the country that I live in? So in Canada, is it possible that I could get parasites just living in Canada without traveling? So these are questions that, you know, if it's a good doctor, you're not gonna be able to ask 10 questions, just pick like five good questions that you wanna ask because they have like literally 10 or 15 minutes with you. Are you aware that the CDC states that, that we can become infected with parasites in our country, that there are multiple parasites that can cause disease in us in Canada or in the United States or wherever you live? So but ahead of time, just go look at the CDC for your country and just, what I did is I just did a Google search of CDC human parasites. So CDC human parasites in North America or in Canada or in the United States and you'll, you'll be directed to the CDC website and to uh, human parasites in your country, in North America, and you'll see there that, so number one, there, the CDC even says that there are parasites in our country. And then another thing that I would do is um, if they're open. So if you've asked a couple of questions and they're kind of like, that's really interesting, that's really fascinating, I don't know much about it, then these are some of the things that you can share with your doctor. Actually, let me backtrack for a minute to finish the question. So the last question is, if the doctor is quite open and, and you say, well, I'd love to share some research with you, and if you feel that it's safe and that it might be helpful for me, would you be willing to treat parasites? Would you be willing to support me in this? I'd love to work with you. And they'll ask you, so would you support me in treating parasites? So in Canada, I don't think they can. In the United States, they can. Probably in the UK, they can. Probably not in Australia or New Zealand. Um, but those are questions you can ask. Unless you can find a functional medicine doctor in Canada, and I think that we're starting to get some of those. But again, they still have, if they're a medical doctor, they still have to follow this, the, their license, right? And of their what they're allowed to practice and what they're not. So, but if you find a GP who's like, it is interesting, like I think with this whole last virus thing we've had for the last two years, even in Canada, there are doctors that did not get the, I'm not gonna say the word on it, but what was recommended to get, they didn't get it. They're, they're very up against and really upset that they were not allowed to treat their patients with very safe, effective treatments. And so now they're starting to become a little bit stronger 
in their approach for integrative. And so we are, I'm sure we're gonna see this coming in, in countries that were really tough. But if your practitioner, your GP, the functional medicine doctor, the nurse practitioner, any of those practitioners that can write prescriptions, if they are willing to look, even go down this path with you, then start to share some research with them. Give them Dr. Alan McDonald's lecture. His lecture, that London lecture, where he's talking about all the filarial worms that he found in every single MS case. And then also he's found the tapeworms. We've got it all listed on our Live Disease Free website. So you can, you can just give them the link uh, very often. They'll have an email address and you can just send them that. And there are a whole bunch of studies linking Lyme disease with MS. There's a whole bunch of studies linking fungus with MS and also the parasites with MS. But because doctors are so busy and they don't have a lot of time to search through things, maybe before you do that, just or at the top of your emails, just say, this is really important and give them Dr. Alan McDonald's lecture. And he has two short, concise posters that we have listed and you can get those. So I would start with Dr. Alan McDonald's um, link to his lecture and links to those two posters, or you can even attach the posters in the email. And then go to the blog on livediseasefree.com. It's called How Pam and Others Are Successfully Treating Parasites That Cause MS. How Pam and Others Are Successfully Treating Parasites That Cause MS. So if you go there, You'll see there's a list of studies, like they're hyperlinked, blue, and just do a copy and paste that into the email. So, and that just, it saves you a bit of time. If you like to research, you can just go to PubMed or just even do a Google search of multiple sclerosis and dysbiosis and just pull up really current studies where they're, they're finding that the microbes that live that are inside the body of MS patients, especially in their digestive tract, they're very different than in healthy people. So though there's probably like five or seven links there that, and so they can even just kind of look at the titles and that helps to tweak their interest. So you're not gonna convince them. You're not gonna change their mind. But if it's an open doctor, if they're interested, there are a few doctors that are starting to study the microbiome in multiple sclerosis and other diseases. And if you're lucky enough to get one of those doctors, then you're fortunate and they would be interested in going further. So just be aware that they're super busy. They're not gonna have a lot of time. Give them the really important things like Dr. Alan McDonald's work about the filarial worms and the tapeworms, and then maybe a few links of dysbiosis. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to put together a more concise page, just a one pager that you guys can give to your practitioners that starts them on this interesting path. And be aware that most of them are not big researchers. They have a busy practice. They have a busy personal life. They're not gonna spend hours and hours going through research like I do, or like maybe you do, but even if we can start to get them thinking, that is really important. And, and that'll give them the rationale of why you're asking for their help. So I was gonna say, type your questions in the question box, whether you're listening to the replay or whether you're joining right now, and I will answer your questions after. I'll see if there are a few questions right now, and then I will answer more of your questions later on. All right, so hello, Kevin. Doctors are not really wanting to prescribe. Yes, I know, I don't wanna say the word, <laughs> the I word since the virus. And it depends on the country. So in Canada, it's so interesting. In Canada, a few years ago, before our students started to use the parasite drugs as part of the treatment plan, the, it was not even that, um, that parasite medication that starts with an I, I'll just say it, ivermectin, because I've shared studies that it is linked to be helpful for MS. So ivermectin was not even available in Canada. Like nobody, no doctors could write prescriptions for it. And so I was like, I called Health Canada and I asked them why. I said, is it because, because this was before we really used it. We were just, I was learning about it. We were learning that the research is showing that it can be really helpful. And again, it's not gonna cure MS. It is one of the parasite drugs that's prescribed very commonly. It's very helpful for MS. 
And the Health Canada agent said, okay, let me look. So she went back in the notes and she said, it's not offered in Canada because there's no market for it. The drug company doesn't feel there's a market for it. And I'm like, really? It is like, it's won a Nobel Prize for one of the most important drugs in the world. And it's not needed in Canada. Anyhow, so now it has been brought back in after that. But naturopaths that can write prescriptions for many of the parasite drugs, they still can't write prescriptions for ivermectin. So that one has to be signed off by a medical doctor. But for people in Canada, which is really neat, is that there is something called telemedicine, where maybe you can find even a doctor, a medically licensed doctor. And what I would do is I would look on the practitioners like that are doing the, the FLCCC work. So that is the group of doctors that are really helping early treatment and long COVID treatment and vaccine injury treatment and all of that. And there are so many doctors that are listed there. And so they're, they're doctors that would think out of the box, like they will go above and beyond, I would think, for their, their patients. So you could possibly do a telemedicine and then you can still get prescriptions. Um, I, I don't want to say it out loud here because I don't want to wreck the, the, how it works, but basically your doctor can write a prescription and you can have that filled out in Canada in a Canadian pharmacy. So there, are, there, there will be more and more options opening up there in that direction. Hi, Laura. What about the link between Epstein-Barr virus? I've got some really great videos on that, Laura. Just go and watch them after because very often they throw us on a bunny trail so that we get off track and that we're not really um, focusing on what makes, what's the most important thing. So in a short, you know, one or two minute explanation, over 90% of the population tests positive for Epstein-Barr virus. So that would be probably upwards of 95, 98%. So the vast majority of everyone's had Epstein-Barr virus and if that was the case, if it was causing MS, we would have a lot more multiple sclerosis. So what we believe and what we have found is that when, you, when we're dealing with a state of dysbiosis, we're really out of balance and we have too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes, then yes, the viruses can be more active, but are they causing our symptoms or would they just test positive because they would have anyhow because you're part of the 98% of the population that tests positive for Epstein-Barr. The study, I explained the study that came out in January and it's a very, very, very tiny, small sample size. So they looked at a huge cohort of military, but then they brought that all the way down to, I think it was about 30 people out of thousands. And so when you look at all of it, it's a big stretch. And so the reason that they want to link Epstein-Barr or another virus is to make a new vaccine, right? And again, then you need to keep getting vaccinations. And this is all about healthcare is ongoing maintenance care, where they keep giving you these expensive vaccines, expensive drugs. It's very, very lucrative. So I'm not convinced that the Epstein-Barr, it is true that if we've had vaccines that apparently that they can be contaminated with various different, um, whether it's, uh, there's monkey viruses, there's uh, herpes virus, there's retroviruses, and they could impact our immune function in some way, maybe making us more susceptible to parasites, making, but the thing is that we can't control that at this point, but we can definitely correct the microbes that live in our body. And when we do that, then we find that people can recover and they can live symptom free. So, you know, I think most of us have had some vaccinations and maybe we have some of these contaminated viruses that came with that and it might, have, it might affect our health in some way, but we can still live an amazing life if we treat the parasites. Awesome. Hi, Karen. So you don't agree compensated for that. Typically, they get paid when they do an MS educational conference. Well, I was shocked, Karen, but if you look into it a little bit more, they do get paid significant amounts of money. Uh, that's something that you can look at for specific drugs. Hello. 
uh, Susie, the doctors are now being paid to push the toxic uh, virus jabs and to and you would never trust them to push that on now. It's really unfortunate. There's, and I, I don't, I don't want to bash the doctors because I, I have had mine retired. I don't really have a GP right now, but a lot of them really mean well. But unfortunately, like if you are in this industry and you know you're really busy and you've got all this overhead and you've spent hundred, two hundred thousand dollars on your education, right? If you've done all of these things and and you're offered, you know, extra compensation from companies where you have a lot of respect for them because you really believe that that there is no known cause of MS, there is no cure, and and then these companies are going to, you know, share the profits with you and you feel that you're doing the best thing for people. I'm just trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. But the problem is, is that it's created. So I'm not faulting the doctors at all. I believe that at the top, that's where I fault, is that they're the ones that have manipulated the educational system. They're the ones that have really kind of coerced the practitioners into getting paid and becoming used to that income and they know better. There is no, there is no incentive to cure disease. When you go deep into this, like what's happened in the past two years with that virus, like when you really go into that and you see like how we've let in Canada, we've let so many people die. We have had so many different safe, effective treatments that could have been used, but we didn't use them. We withheld it from our citizens and then we've allowed them to die. And again, it's not the doctor's fault. Those are the health authorities, political government officials dictating that. This is the world that I've lived in for over 30 years is that, you know, that we know through the research, there's so much research now sharing, like before it was just a few hero doctors, a few studies. Now there are so many studies that validate this. There is, there's no excuse not to treat parasites. Like there is none other than there's a system in place. It's a well-oiled machine. It is lucrative and it does not want to budge because there's trillions of dollars involved. So I'm so happy that you're healthier now than ever before, Susie. That is so awesome. Again, we don't, in my humble opinion, and I'm not a medical expert and I can't give medical advice, but what I've seen just even in the last two years with the solutions for this virus um, that have been pushed on us, I just don't trust it at all anymore. I really, really don't. Thank you, Susie. You are wonderful too. Victoria, you stopped dealing with doctors and you started getting better. There's so many people, Victoria, that I talk to that aren't even taking MS maintenance drugs, right? So these newer MS maintenance drugs here are over $100,000 per year for the rest of your life or as long as your body can handle it. And so many people have just stopped taking them, working with their doctor, working with their pharmacist. Sometimes you have to, you have to go off of them slowly or else you can feel really awful, but they feel better off of them. And when you think about it, there is not a single MS drug that treats the parasites. All they do is they suppress your immune system. So when you're dealing with a lot of infection and you suppress your soldiers, so you're dealing with a huge enemy, you suppress your soldiers, then the, the enemy really has an upper hand. And then we end up in time becoming much worse and quicker when we're taking them. So I'm not against pharmaceuticals. We sometimes use them in treating parasites because they can be really helpful, especially for the really big worms or the parasites that get into the central nervous system or in our organs. Sometimes the herbs are not enough and we love them and we would prefer them, but we use a layering of treatments. We use the parasite drugs when necessary, but anti antimicrobial herbs and also oxidizing agents. So all three together is really the winning mix. But we also do a lot of prep work before we start treating so that we tolerate all the treatments better and we, have, we recover quicker. We have more success and we recover quicker. You're very welcome. Jacqueline, hi Maureen, no worries. I'm just so happy to be here live with you again. I missed you guys so much. It's so boring for me to record a video just looking at a camera and not knowing that anybody else is there. 
it's really hard. I just, I know this is still not the same as being in front of people, but it's better than talking to myself. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Yes, I do. We have students all over the world. It, we're not limited thanks to the internet. So I help, I help people find practitioners and that's, I'll go on to the solution. I know that there's quite a few different, um, I'll just answer a couple more here. So Naomi, you've been following the diet, our diet for two years and you've had huge improvements in your MS symptoms, yay. So that's the live disease free diet that she's following. And now she's pregnant and she's added dairy and grains. I personally would be really careful with the dairy. So. Um, I wouldn't have dairy, definitely supplement with calcium, but the dairy is dangerous because it is something that doesn't work with chronic disease. And you can still get enough calcium without. So I, with my third son, I did not have any dairy and our students don't have dairy. Some of them do get pregnant, especially when they start treating the infections, their infertility corrects. So be careful with the dairy. Um, and if you're having a little bit of brown rice or, or quinoa, et cetera, that's absolutely fine. But just be really careful with the dairy and just stay away from sugar. So just follow the diet, make sure to get lots of healthy, good quality fats and use as little grains as needed. And then Steve and doctors are scared that they won't get paid. And you're right, or sacked. So like in Canada, that one doctor that literally kicked me out of his office, he was an allergy doctor, he said that if there are any integrative practitioners, this was a few years ago, mind you, probably 10 years ago, if there are any integrated or do medical doctors that are kind of into this, you know, this, this hokey pokey, <laughs> like woo woo, integrative health stuff, they run them out of town, their group, because it's a small clicky group. He was very, and he was young. I was so shocked because he was in his 30s and I would have thought he would have been a little bit more open and I was very careful in what I said, very respectful, just asking questions like, you know, it, do we have any tests for, for candida? And it was like, what do you mean for candida? And I said, do you know doctors that are doing this work? And what do you mean? Like, and he was just really, he said, if there's research, I still remember the conversation. If there was research, I would know about it. And anyhow, so it was a very nasty conversation. But so if you have a, a, like an MD in our town who would like to help, who doesn't really know how to treat parasites because he's never been trained, he would never take a risk because it's a small clicky town. It's not a really tiny town, but the doctors know each other and they, they definitely can definitely get ostracized, et cetera. And it's so awful in our town, like in Canada, like you can't even get a doctor. Like you have to go on a wait list. And I don't even know how long that would be. So Louise, if MS is infectious, then, uh, then does that do away completely with any theory that any, like that um, MS is hereditary? So, I don't believe that multiple sclerosis is hereditary at all. But what is inherited is we inherit the microbes from our mom and our dad in the birth canal when we're born. So if our mother or father have the disease causing parasites in their digestive tract, whatever is growing in the mother's birth canal is the product of what's living in the father's digestive tract the intestines and the mothers, unless it's a C-section, and then the child gets whatever's in the um, operating room or the birthing room. So it is not hereditary. I don't believe it is. There's no evidence that it is, and it is for sure an infectious disease. There's, if you look at the research and people are recovering and there's just more and more coming out, and it's just, it's exciting. It's a very exciting time. Yes, Stephen, trillions. A uh, couple more here, and then I am going to let you go here. So any doctor that pushes toxic drug because of money is wrong. I, I agree, but they don't believe that it's toxic. They believe, right? They, they've been conditioned to believe, and this is where we have to understand where they're at. So they have been conditioned to believe that, that they're the experts, nobody knows what MS is, and if they, if, if, 
they knew what it was, they would know because they're the expert. They would be told because they're the experts in the world. And the treatments they have are the best options. They are the safest. So the, the drug companies keep giving them specific studies on their drugs. But very often we find out that those studies are not done very well and eventually find out that the drugs made no difference. But at the time, they, the doctors get really excited because they see this study that, oh, this Copaxone, it decreases MS symptoms by like 30%. And then the drug companies have been caught in over-promoting and, and making their drugs look more helpful than they really are. So all of these factors combined is that that's their bias. That's why they think that way. It's not that they're evil and they want to make money and, and hurt us. It's that they honestly, they've been told these drugs work. They're showing studies that these drugs work. They're told every day that this is the way to go and that it's still wrong. It's still absolutely wrong, but we just have to understand what we're dealing with. All right, and then Karen is just asking, this is kind of a long one, um, and you were told, so your doctors prescribe certain meds by another company. It is a huge kickback, doc doctors are paid to prescribe medications of all kinds. It is true, it is so sad, but it is true, like huge. It could be like, like what I shared with you, that one study or one uh, journalist, docu uh, not a documentary, but an article where they were sharing the 2,500 practitioners, just within five years, they were making over a half a million dollars per year on prescribing certain medications. And then 700 of them were making over a million dollars. So this is not little, little bit of money, this is a lot. Is H. pylori uh, a parasite? Yes. Any microbe that lives in you and causes you harm. It could be bacteria, it could be protists, it could be worms, and it could be fungi. When are you starting a new program again? Uh, I don't know who you are, just says Facebook user. So I'm going to share right now the solution. You don't have to wait. We have students joining every week. And what we have, and, and this, I'm just letting you know that what I do is we have the Live Disease Free program. And what this does is it, it teaches you how to play that active role in your healthcare so that you do all the prep work yourself, you're able to find practitioners and you'll know the treatments, you'll know the doses, you'll know how to take them safely because even if you find a practitioner, then they usually don't know how to treat parasites. And so you have to play an active role. And the nice thing is we have a practitioner members area. We're also like the, the doses and the, how we're taking them is all backed by science, by pharmacies, by other doctors. So the nice thing is, is that you're in good hands and it doesn't matter where you live, we will support you. So the key is that if you, you know, like take this information and if you feel that you can handle this on your own, great, right? You can try to look for a doctor. But again, there's so much to this. Like once you find a doctor that's willing to work with you, then how do you know? Like what parasite drugs to even test? How do you know where to access them? How do you know? Because again, like the pharmacies, most of the pharmacies, they don't carry these parasite drugs, even though they're safe and they're old, they've been around forever. They don't even carry them because the doctors don't prescribe. They don't treat parasites. So then, you know, if you ask a, a pharmacy to bring in a certain drug, let's say even ivermectin, it could be thousands of dollars. And it's not supposed to cost that. If you were in a third world country, it would cost pennies for a lot of these drugs. So. I help you to be able to get ready to treat, to know what you need to do for treatment, to build a treatment plan, to access practitioners, to access the treatments in the cheapest way. And the really, what I say about the Live Disease Free Program, it's a course. Don't think of it as going to a naturopath or a doctor and fix me. This is a skill that you learn and you have it for the rest of your life. And we advocate for, as cost-effective way to recover as possible. We don't recommend a bunch of supplements. We recommend minimal supplements, like a multivitamin mineral, maybe some calcium, and that's about it. We don't recommend a bunch of tests. We don't recommend stool tests. You can spend 500 to $1,000 or more 
and you're not gonna get the information you need. So we really focus, and if you have been down the integrative practitioner road, you some people have spent 100 to $300,000 on their health, and they're still sick. It doesn't have to cost that much. And the crazy thing is that with this whole healthcare system that is not sustainable, where we have all these different specialists, like, you know, a specialist for children, a specialist for pregnant women, a specialist for somebody that has Crohn's disease, a specialist for somebody that has MS. It's ridiculous. If we're talking about health, there's like five or so simple principles that we all use. And then if we have symptoms of something, that means our microbes are out of balance. We can either have nutritional deficiencies and we correct that with a healthy diet. We can have toxins from our environment or usually from these parasites. That's where most of the toxins come from. And when you take care of those three things, you don't need all these specialists. You don't need this multi-trillion dollar industry. But that is why we're so stuck. And so you can decide to keep following that industry or you can decide like myself and the wellness champions to take a different path to say, I've had enough of this. I want my life back. I'm going to treat the cause. I'm going to get on with my life. And then that skill that you learn in that program, what it does is it really helps you to, number one, if you have a family, like your children, it just really gives them, you teach them the skills so that they never have to end up in your situation like you did. You know, they're not going to be perfect. (laughs) They might make mistakes, but at least they know. They're not going to be ignorant like we were. When I was diagnosed, I had no idea if I would have known I had such a severe case of optic neuritis. I had a complete patch over my eye for like days. And then I had to go on prednisone. And if I would have, somebody would have told me back then, I could have settled that inflammation quickly. And I could have probably had most recovery, if not full recovery from that. But I didn't know. And thank God that I was able to figure out about infections right after that. And so I was able to take a different path and start to treat infections after that. But if I wouldn't have known... And that came through a lot of prayer. That came through like just begging God for an answer. And I cannot tell you how many people come to me and say, Pam, I was at the end of my rope. I was at wit's end. I cried out to God. I was begging him like to help me, to give me an answer. And then you popped up on Facebook or on YouTube or whatever. I have this all the time. And I, and that like, I'm always asking God, like I want to be on track. And, And then if I get that confirmation, it helps me. And I still know that I'm a work in progress, but it, I am passionate about this because I feel it's my calling. I feel that if, you know, it'd be much easier with all the, the censorship and everything to quit, to just go do something else. I'm a teacher, I'm a horticulturalist. I can do so many other things, but I can't let this die. I want this to go mainstream. I want to work myself out of a job. I want doctors to take over this. And I believe what has happened in the past two years, all the awful stuff we've gone through, the lockdowns, the, the, all of the difficulties that we've gone through, I think we're going to have this major, major shift and we're going to have a bright new healthcare coming out of the other end. And I want to be seeing that and I want to share this wisdom and I want to make sure that people are being taken care of. It's enough. Enough is enough. Enough suffering. It's so ridiculously simple. I mean, we don't know exactly the parasites we have, but we know that they are disease-causing bacteria. We know that they are disease-causing fungi and protists and worms. And we know that the treatments all help and we know how to recover. We just need to get more doctors on board. So again, if you're at the place where you're like, Pam, this makes so much sense, but you know, I. I don't know, first time I met you, I just wanna make sure this is legit. Watch my videos on YouTube, Facebook, and come to our website. If I'm censored, which one of these days I probably will step over the line, then always come to livediseasefree.com. We're putting our videos up there, and I am starting to upload on Rumble too, and I will be on Brighteon and Rumble, so if I'm not here, I will be on those platforms, but just stay in touch, learn, start to implement the diet, just as that one person shared in the feed how she's been following the diet and it's helped her so much. All of the information is on there, on the videos. And there's, uh, there's a guide, there's a live disease free community on Facebook. Also on our website, you can get the guidelines for the live disease free plan. You can start to change your diet. You can start to get the inflammation down. 
start to feel better, learn about the parasites, and when you're ready, if you need support, if you need a plan to treat the infections, reach out to us. Go to livediseasefree.com or watch the masterclass training that I have. It will be in the feed of this. It'll probably be above the video and maybe below of this uh, video here. And you can learn about the steps we take. You can hear case studies of amazing wellness champions. And actually, Kevin is listening right now. And I just interviewed him last week, and I'll be putting him up on our website. Uh, so these are the heroes. These are the forerunners. These are the, the people, I call them the trailblazers, the leaders, the forward thinkers, through their diligence, through their work and implementing really well they are blazing a trail for you. They're showing you that it's not just Pam, that there are many others recovering, that this is the answer. And the last thing I'll leave you with is if you have a lot of disability and you feel like, is there any hope for me? Like, I'm probably too far gone. No, you're not. We have students that have been disabled, severely disabled for, haven't been able to walk for five or 10 years and they might have to work a little harder. They might take them a few more months of treating. But by the one year mark, if they've, and less sometimes, but they are starting to take steps with crutches. Their ankles that were seized up for years are becoming soft and they're able to move them. Their hand that was clenched like a claw for years is able to move. So as we get more doctors on board, as we get more researchers that are, you know, creating better. Uh, tests to figure out which exactly of the parasites like because we know that there's different ones it's not always the same ones and it's not just one or two unfortunately students test well for three to five parasite drugs at a time so but it, it still works right it, it takes a little bit of effort but it still works it's still worth it month by month feeling better and better and better instead of month by month feeling worse all the time all right, we've gone on for an hour. I have thoroughly enjoyed being live with you. I know I didn't answer all the questions. I will come back and answer them. And our team, Marissa and Caroline, we will answer them also. We want to support you wherever you're at. I've got lots of free content or watch my masterclass. Reach out, become a wellness champion. You can join this week, next week, and take care. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye for now.